One way of figuring out how this parallelism works is to try some examples. Now let's talk about two examples in order to figure out what might be better applied to a loosely coupled uh, MIMD system versus a tightly coupled MIMD system. First one, one that's used a lot in electronics, or excuse me, in the, in the discussion of parallelism, is this idea of approximating pi. All right, now how would we do this? Well, one of the ways to do this is something referred to as the Monte Carlo method. And the Monte Carlo method says, if I take, and I realize that doesn't really look like a circle, but if I put a circle inside of a square and I have them both have exactly the same, uh, same, same dimension. So the dimension of this square, so I've got, I don't know, how about, let's just say uh, we've got the radius is equal to 1, which means the dimension of one side of this square is equal to 2r, right? All right, so the area of the circle, well, that's pi r squared, right? So this is area of the circle. Now, what about the area of the square? Well, the area of the square, if the side is 2r, then it's just simply 4r squared, right? And that'll give us the areas. Now, if I have a ratio, if I create a ratio of the area of the circle to the area of the square, so I'm just going to simply say ac over as, what is that equal to? Well, the area of the circle is pi r squared. The area of the square is 4 r squared. So r squares cancel out. And if I can get this ratio, if I can figure out this ratio, well, what I should be able to figure out is that pi is approximately equal to 4 times the a c over a s, right? Well, how am I going to get this ratio? Well, the way I do this is I can randomly generate points. And if I randomly generate enough points and I figure out how many are inside of the circle versus how many are outside, or excuse me, how many are inside of the square versus how many, let's try this again. If I can figure out the ratio of the number of random points that are inside the square, so I'm gonna generate random points inside the square and figure out how many of those would be inside of the circle and come up with that ratio. If, uh, if my number of random points is high enough, then I'm going to end up getting a very good approximation of pi. It turns out this gives us a very good good approximation of pi. Well, how do you figure out if a point is inside of the circle? Well, what we do is we've got, if this point right here is the x equals zero, the y equals zero point, then all I need to do is if I get a coordinate for one of these guys, x sub one, y sub one, that's supposed to be a y, and if I get that coordinate, then all I have to do is see if x1 squared plus y1 squared, and, and yes, Pythagorean theorem has us taking the square root of that, but what I want to see is, is this less than or equal to 1? That will tell me if it is inside of that circle. So the idea is that I've got one controlling node inside of my MIMD system, and it's got a bunch of peripheral nodes that it can pass tasks off to. And so the whole point is everybody knows this code. So that code is distributed to all of those processing units. And all we're going to do is simply say, okay, I'm going to give, and we'll just simply say 10,000. We're going to simply send 10,000 off to each one of these nodes, which says, I want you to come up with 10,000 random points. I have to know how many they're going to compute. And so each one of them is going to come up with 10,000 random points. And inside the processing unit, they're going to figure out if 
the point that they generated, the random point that they generated, is inside the circle or not. Now, when each one is done, then they're going to return the number inside. So let's say that this one found out that, you know, that, uh, I don't know, that 9,000 points were inside. So it generated 10,000 random points, 9,000 of them were inside. It's going to send 9,000 back to the, the, the node that's going to bring together all of this information. And then this node's going to calculate 10,000 random points and send back its resulting number that are inside. And so there's a very low number or very low amount of information being passed back and forth here. A single integer being passed to a processing node, it already knows the code that it's supposed to be executing. That's also passed to it uh, through the network, but that's kind of, that's a detail we're not worried about right now. So we pass the, the pass the information to that node, how many random points we want to generate, and it's going to simply return the number of points that it generated that ended up inside the circle. Then this guy right here is going to have, and it's probably going to do its own 10,000 points, it's going to combine its results with the results passed ret returned to it from each one of the nodes in order to come up with this ratio. And whenever it comes up with the ratio, the number of points, the, the number of points inside the square, that's the number it assigns. So it's 10,000 plus 10,000 plus 10,000 plus 10,000 plus its own 10,000, so 50,000. And then it's going to sum all the integers that came back to it along with its own computation in order to get the number of points that are inside the circle. Those two, th those two, it'll take, and, and then the master node right there just simply takes the ratio, multiplies it by four, it's got an approximation of pi. Now what makes this really nice in terms of a parallelized problem is the low communication overhead. We're going to see with this next example, that's not always the case. Now, what if we've got a different problem that requires a lot more interaction between the nodes? For example, let's take a look at this heat map. This, this, I just created this quickly. This problem is a little bit more difficult, a heat transfer problem. This problem says that what I've got is a particular, well, we've got a two-dimensional array, this array of all these points throughout this two-dimensional plane, and what we've got is each one of those points has a different temperature. Now, if you look at one of these points, we can see that the neighboring points will affect the temperature at that particular point. So if you combine the temperature at the point that we're interested in, plus the values that are in all the, or the temperatures that are in all of the neighboring pixels or points, that will give us the ability to figure out what at time t plus one, the temperature is going to be in that particular element. Turns out that every single element though is going to have to do this calculation. If I were to divide this into multiple regions and then have each region monitored or taken care of by a different processing unit, most of the area inside of each processing unit's region, it can just go ahead and do that calculation. It can figure out what the temperature of a particular point is, an array element, by figuring out all of its neighbors. But at some point, you are going to get to a boundary. So if I've got this is the edge of my area that my processing unit is responsible for, then I've got these points that are being calculated by another processing unit. In order to figure out the temperature of this guy, I've got three of the points I'm concerned with, but I also need to share data. Now, before I can move on to T plus two, in other words, in, in order to move to the next stage, I have to be able to calculate the temperature for each one of these boundaries. Same is true for this neighboring processor. And the problem is, is that now I've got data that needs to be shared back and forth. This gives you a large amount of communication overhead. And so if we're talking about a cluster, where in order to pass the information or the values for these boundary pixels or these boundary points, in order to pass that to another processing unit takes 
compiling a message and delivering it over a network, which is not nearly as fast as an interface with memory, turns out that maybe this is not necessarily an application, an application for a cluster. Instead, because of the shared memory aspect of a symmetric multiprocessor, that shared memory gives us the ability to pass the information about these boundary elements a little bit quicker. But we move on to something that's now called cache coherence because a lot of the times this data that I'm working on is going to be in a local cache, a cache that is not accessible by the other processing units. And so in our next lesson, we're going to talk about this idea of making sure that our cache stays up to date so we're operating on the most up-to-date data.